Hi all. This interview with Professor Donald Hoffman was recorded during lockdown in 2020 for a film I was making called The Next Great Big Breakthrough in Our Understanding of the Universe. I'm about to play a 30 second trailer for that film and then we will have the full and very wonderful interview. All right, thanks. The latest experiments reveal that nothing in the universe is as it seems. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. Uh, as I'm just getting my head around this a little bit. We're on a quest. Oh yeah, hi Dr. Clark. To find... You certainly haven't gone mad. The next great big breakthrough. If ever you are looking for a genius, this guy is it. In our understanding of the universe. I've simply never seen a case where things have gone so well. So do we find it? Well, you can find out. Watch the full video on the YouTube channel now. Click the link below. Professor Hoffman, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. My pleasure, thank you. So I'm looking for the next great big breakthrough in our understanding of the universe. And I believe you've discovered something really important. And it's actually to do with not what's out there that I'm seeing and hearing and thinking about, but actually what's going on here. Um, what, what, so tell me a little bit about it. Yes. So. The standard framework of science for the last several centuries has been that space-time and its contents, like particles, objects, energy, mass, and so forth, is the fundamental reality. So it's a physicalist space-time reality. And that has been a Sorry, tremendous... You mean, so you mean time and space are real? Is that what you're saying? That's been the assumption that space and time are the fundamental fabric of reality. That's what reality is. And the contents of space time are the, are the basic stuff of reality. So it all started at the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. It was only space and time and energy and particles and so forth. No life, no consciousness, just a physicalist space time energy uh, framework. And that's been incredibly productive for centuries. I mean, mm. science has been incredibly successful for several centuries, at least since Newton, in that framework. And all of our modern technology is due to that framework and our standard of living is due to it. So it's been incredibly successful. And three pinnacles, theoretical pinnacles of that framework, general relativity, mm. quantum field theory, and evolution by natural selection, incredibly powerful theories that were developed within that framework. And all three of those theories are telling us that space-time is doomed, that space-time cannot be fundamental. All three of them are saying the same thing. Uh, I'm just getting my head around this a little bit. So, so you're, you've just told me that time and space, so the distance between my two fingers here isn't and I, you know, we've, we've been happy with that. General relativity is happy with that, isn't it? Quantum mechanics is happy that there's a sort of distance between my two fingers, but you're just telling me that the actual idea of from there to there, as, as I see it, is doomed. Is that right? Uh, yes, I'm saying that the idea that, that, that the space between your fingers and the space that we see throughout the universe is a fundamental reality, that that's the bedrock of reality. That assumption, which has been so powerful, is false. Space-time is doomed as the foundational concept in science. And our, our, you know, those three theories, general relativity, quantum field theory, and evolution by natural selection, all point to the need in science for a deeper framework that's not space and time or space-time, but that allows space-time somehow to emerge as, as a, a secondary concept, but not a primary concept. But the theories are not able to tell us what that deeper reality might be. So our theories can say space-time is doomed, but they can't say what we're going to find behind space-time. All right. Wow. So how? So I was talking to uh, Professor Gerard Tuft, and he was looking for the. He was. He wasn't happy with the the, the status quo at the moment, which is. This idea that we've got these incredible equations in quantum mechanics that tell us a whole, tell us very, very precisely what happens uh, in our universe, but we have really no idea how those equations came about in a sort of 
in a in a sort of logical understanding of them. And he's looking, he's looking kind of beneath the bonnet of quantum mechanics. Is is that has that got anything to do with? So how, you said that quantum mechanics actually points towards space time being doomed. Uh, how is quantum mechanics point towards space time being doomed? The way it points to it is that um, when you bring quantum mechanics and general relativity together and you try, the, the simplest case is suppose you're trying to look at things smaller and smaller. So instead of using a telescope to look out into outer space, we're using stronger and stronger microscopes to look smaller and smaller and smaller. Quantum mechanics tells us effectively, think of it this way, if you're going to see something with light, to look at finer and finer detail, you need smaller and smaller wavelengths of light to resolve this, the smaller detail, right? Right. But it turns out quantum mechanics says as the wavelengths get smaller and smaller, the energy goes up and up. Um, yeah. And so it turns out when you do the math, when you bring gravity and quantum theory together, there's a limit. You can go smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to roughly what they call the Planck scale. 10 to the minus 33, 34 centimeters. Yeah. And then space-time ceases to be a viable concept. You get a black hole. So what happens is you, by getting more, smaller and smaller resolution in your, in your wavelengths, the energy goes up to the point, so there's so much energy in such a small space, you create a black hole and you destroy the very thing that you're trying to measure. And if you say, well, I'll, I'll try it harder, I'll get smaller wavelengths, you just make a bigger black hole the very notion of space-time falls apart. It, it's, it's not even well-defined mm -hmm. anymore. And mm -hmm. so that's pointing to the idea, if it's not even, if there's no way in principle for it to be measured, that suggests that it's not a fundamental concept. There's something deeper that we have to go after. I remember reading various books by Hawking and whatever, and yeah, you reach, you reach a lot of nasty infinities in the math and things, don't you? So that's, that's you, you, you've, you've kind of broken the, the equations have broken down, it's not working anymore. So right. yes, I'm with you on that one. Evolution, how on earth does evolution come into this? How is, when I talk to physicists, they don't often bring evolution to us, because evolution is an is a, is a on earth thing. And that's exactly. interesting. We've been, I've been looking out into space and looking at very, very small things that uh, may or may not be, you know, uh, actually the, the small things are enough, but the, a lot of the things that seem to be falling apart are very, very, very distant things, things that are far from the human scale, either really big or really small. So how, tell me, how does evolution point towards space time not existing? Right. So it, most of us, it, it, most of my colleagues think that evolution shapes our senses to tell us truths about objective reality. The idea is that those of our ancestors who saw reality more accurately had an advantage in the standard activities of life, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. So you see a, you see a, a deer or something, right. and the better you're able to see, the better you're right. able to see the deer, and therefore you can go and spear right. the deer and have a nice, have a nice dinner. Exactly. So you need to see the truth about what's really out there, right? And if you see, the, and not all the truth, right? But we only see a small amount of the wavelengths of light and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But, but we, we, if you see a deer, that's because there really is a deer. If you see a cliff, that's because there really is a cliff. And, and so we're seeing those aspects of reality that we need. Of course, the aspects that an ant needs to see are very, very different than what an elephant needs to see. Um, and, and so, but the idea is that in your niche, evolution would shape you to see those aspects of the truth that you need to survive and reproduce. And if you don't see the truth, you're less likely to pass on your genes. So that's the, it, which coded for your perceptions. On the other hand, if you do see the truth, then you're more likely to pass on the genes which code for seeing the truth. And that's why we can be confident that we see the truth. So that's the standard informal argument that, that many of my colleagues um, have, have made. Not all. I mean, uh, some brilliant colleagues like Steven Pinker understand that evolution um, can shape us to have untrue beliefs. <laughs> okay, but in essence, the better I'm able to see what's, the better I'm able to see the truth, the better I'm able to uh, survive. The That's I'm... right. That's okay. the bottom line. That's, That's the bottom line intuition. Yeah. Absolutely. So, the, yeah, if I see the truth, uh, the truth that I need, then I'm more likely to survive and pass on my genes, which let me see the truth. And so that's 
That's an interesting um, argument. It sounds very, very plausible. Who could argue against that? But yeah. I decided to check it out. Um, back in around 2008, started looking at that more carefully. It turns out that evolution, we don't have to wave our hands about what it says. There's a mathematical model of evolution by natural selection. It's called evolutionary game theory. Uh, a, a brilliant British scientist, John Maynard Smith, invented this back in the 70s and it's taken off and it's 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 incredibly powerful tool. And so with some of my graduate students, Brian Marion and Justin Mark, we did simulations just to see what would go on there. And their simulations showed that no, the the simulated creatures that saw the truths were not out competing the creatures that saw none of the truth and were just being tuned to the fitness payoffs. And so the, the key notion is these fitness payoffs. So the way you can think about evolution is it's, it's think about it like a video game. When you're in a video game, um, you're trying to get points as fast as you can. And if you get enough points in a short enough time, then you might get to the next level of the game. And if you don't, then you die. Well, evolution is sort of like that. It's sort of, you, we're in this game, you have to get fitness payoffs. Those are, that's the technical term, these fitness payoffs. So there's, there are these payoff functions. And if you get enough, you don't go to the next level, but your genes, your, your children go to the next level. And so it's, it's just, essentially, the game is about collecting fitness payoffs. So the question- They would be food, they'd be- uh... Yes, mates. Mates, very important. And that's where you say, so the next level is you have babies. Exactly, exactly right. And also avoiding danger, avoiding falling off cliffs, eating poison and things like that. So, yeah. so these are all the kind, there's negative payoffs and, and positive payoffs. And, and so the idea is to, um, the, the game of evolution in some sense is to get more, more payoffs than your competition. So it's not about getting perfect on the payoffs. That's not what it is. So there's no perfection in evolution. It's, 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 if you're better than the competition, that's good enough, that's all. So it's just a, a, what they call a satisfying solution. So, but the idea is that, our, that creatures whose senses um, were shaped to see more of, of the truth than their com competition would be a little bit more fit. So that was the idea. Well, so it, after we did the simulations, then I worked with uh, a colleague, Chaitan Prakash um, and um, uh, Kyle Stevens, and we have a theorem. The, the theorem is, is quite the opposite of the intuitions. The, the theorem says that the probability is zero, that an organism that sees reality as it is will be more fit than an organism of equal complexity that sees none of reality and is just tuned to the fitness payoffs. So in other words, I'll put it really briefly. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. That's what the theorem says. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. Wow. So you and your cohorts, you, 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 you used, a, you made a virtual, some virtual creatures. You put them in a, in a game, a very, which mimics evolution very, very precisely. Cause you've got this very precise, brilliant model of, of how evolution works. And you, you told some of the creatures, you let them see everything that was around them as it was. And these other creatures, you gave them traits, where they were so they it wasn't it wasn't that they saw what was around them as it was what did they were just you said tuned to the fitness payoffs what does that mean what were they what was coming they they sensing so they they were just saying that all they knew is if i take this action i will be harmed if i take this action i will be helped i don't know what what the world is all i know is that if i take this action in the world i will die or or not die that's that's all they could do so they couldn't see what the world was. They, they just saw um, bad, good, bad, good, you know, don't do this, don't do that. So you've got, uh, you've got two sets of creatures. The guys who are seeing what's around them are dying out. And the guys, the creatures who are just kind of like, they know to do this and not to do that and to do this, but they're not really seeing the world around them, are evolving exactly. and reproducing and doing much better. And this world that you've created inside the computer this virtual world based on this evolutionary game theory is very mathematically accurate and so accurate that you believe that that it's this is what is happening on the earth with creatures on earth so right. my next question is why why is it that these guys who aren't seeing reality 
and are just kind of going left is good, right is bad, are doing so much better than these guys who are kind of seeing everything that's around them. What's going on with that? What's why? Yeah, th that's a great question. The, I think the best way to get the intuition is suppose you have two people playing um, a, a race car game on, on, on a computer, right? Maybe over a network. But one guy gets to just turn a wheel and see, you know, graphics of cars and so forth, the race racetrack. The other guy has a, an electrode and he's inside the computer and he's toggling voltages as fast as he can to try to play the game. And, and, and the question is, which guy's going to win the game? The guy who can just turn his wheel and, and or the guy who's going to have to like toggle voltage, good luck toggling voltages. So you're seeing the truth, but it won't help you play the game. So that's sort of the reason. Oh, why. wow. So I was going, I was going like, I was thinking the wrong way around then, because when you said the guy who's driving and he's seeing the seeing the road, he's not actually seeing what's real. That's right. You're saying the guy who's toggling the voltages is seeing what's real. So in your in your virtual world, these guys who were seeing what's real, they weren't seeing the road. They were seeing voltages and stuff like that. Right, right. In this analogy, that's right. That's right. Oh my god! And so these guys were seeing a a a, 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 a VR, a virtual VR. reality. That and that's what evolution gave us. Space time, as you perceive it when you look around, is a virtual reality that's evolved to hide the truth. It lets you play the game like the video game, driving the car and turning the steering wheel without seeing the reality that you are affecting reality and we're completely ignorant of what that reality is and how we're affecting it. We don't know what we're really doing. All we know is what we see ourselves doing within this little virtual game. That's what evolution gave us. So, oh my gosh. So, uh, and the reason is because it's, easier to understand the virtual world is easier is that right it takes less time less energy it allows you to act more quickly so so just like the guy trying to toggle voltages to win the the video game is it's going to be too slow he's seeing the truth but it's just too slow and too complicated so evolution has just wiped that away and says you don't need to know all that we have given you this simple dumbed down user interface that hides the truth and just gives you a little eye candy that says that's good, that's bad, do this, don't do that. And, but of course, we're, we have made a rookie mistake. We've assumed that our virtual reality headset is the truth. So science has assumed that space-time is fundamental. It's just our headset. And it's been good, we've studied our headset, we really understand our VR headset that, that evolution gave us. And sci science is now at the point where we realize, our theories are saying, oh, space-time is just a headset there's something beyond and we now have the tools of science that i think are adequate to take a step beyond the space-time headset beyond the virtual reality and start to ask what is the reality behind this vr headset that, we, that evolution has given us what are the physical in our okay so this is getting confusing obviously because you, you you're saying that um the world we're living in that we see is like a virtual reality headset. But you also said that we were understanding that virtual reality headset. Now I'm assuming that understanding comes from looking at the brain, does it? Because I'm assuming, so t tell me what's the physical, what are the physical in our virtual world? What are the physical, tr how does the physical, what's going on in our brain that lets me, that makes you think that we're, that there's, this is going on this is uh, simplifying right, right so this gets very very interesting in a virtual reality if if i have my headset on and i look over there and i see a green mustang right there is no real green mustang right that's just when i look over there i get some pixels sprayed to my eyes and i create the experience of a green mustang when i turn my head over here and i see a red ferrari i have deleted the green Mustang, it, it doesn't exist. There's no green Virtual Mustang inside the yeah. computer. Yeah. I got rid of it. Yeah. So what's happening is that every object that I see, I'm creating when I look, and then I destroy it when I look over the computer. The computer's creating it in your head, or the headset's creating it. Well, the, all the headset is doing is, is lighting up pixels. You actually create the experience of the, of the car. 
the the green Mustang and so forth, right? There's only pixels on the headset. If you look, if you look really closely at the pixels. Okay, the headset, sorry. Are we talking? Are we talking about a metaphor of the virtual world, or are we talking about the real world right now? Or, or this is just a metaphor, and so I'm just trying to give yeah. you a metaphor about to, so to in, make a big point. Which in you know, I I mean, but in the virtual world, in the metaphor, sorry about this, the computer creates the color of those pixels. That's it. That's right. So that's what I mean by, by, right. by when you look that way, when you turn this way, it's the computer that's erased the pixels that made the shape of the car that we understand. That's to right. Be exactly right. Exactly right. So it's, it's erased those pixels. And, and then you have no longer created that green Mustang because now you're creating a red Ferrari. Right? You're, I mean, the green. computer's creating the red Ferrari. Well, it's only creating the pixels. <laughs> All right, the computer's created the, the pixels that appear to us to be red that right, we that, then right. decide is exactly a Ferrari. Right. That, okay. That's right. <laughs> okay, I'm with you. And the big point here is though objects in space time only exist when you look. When you look away, so you create the moon when you look and you destroy it when you look away. There's something that's real, but it's not the moon. Just so like. This is fascinating. I mean, this, because one of the things that always amazed me is that our brain is so big and so complicated, uh, just mind-bogglingly big, isn't it? I mean, in terms of numbers, isn't the amount of neurons that we've got in our head something like... Yeah, I, mean, it's just, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you look around the universe for things that are as complicated as that, and I don't see an object that is. So we've got this unbelievable on a unit. If you if you put all the most complicated objects in the universe on a, you know, the brain's going to be up there, isn't it? And half of it, half of the brain is devoted to taking whatever comes into our eyes and our ears and our nose, and uh, translating it, should I say, into something that we can understand. Right. Uh, so your so all that work that's been done in looking into brains and stuff, your idea really does play into this. The idea that um, our brain is creating the reality, like a virtual reality around us. And is our brain, in a, is that half of our brain that's doing all that stuff? Is that like the headset in a way? In your Well, it's, it's even crazier than that. I'm saying we don't have a brain when we don't look. Okay. Brains don't, there's anything in space time is just virtual because space time itself is just our headset. So it's fine for everyday neuroscience and I to, to talk about brains causing our behavior and our experiences that's perfectly fine for everyday neuroscience, but strictly speaking, it's false. I only have a brain and I only have neurons when someone looks and sees a brain and neurons. So anything in space and time is, is just virtual, including the brain. So if, my virtual so if a human's virtual reality headset is telling me that there's a red corvette over there and a tree up there presumably other animals could have quite different headsets is that true because there was something that always struck me as as that kind of backs up what you're talking about i think in nature which was some really bizarre animal behaviors and i'm thinking maybe they do see the world Absolutely. I mean, is it true? Could other animals potentially uh, imagine the world or perceive the world in a completely different way to us? Is that, is that yes. possible? The way that they perceive the world could be utterly alien to anything that we could even imagine. Because there was this albatross in, uh, that was nesting uh, and it, it had a, a, a chick, but the climate change has caused things to get a bit windy. And the chick went out, fell out of the nest. It was on David oh. Attenborough. The albatross comes down and it's almost like it didn't see the chick. It only feeds the chick if the chick is on the nest. So it comes down, its belly's full of food, it's ready to regurgitate. And the chick's just outside the nest in the, in the tufts of grass. You know, this majestic albatross is sitting there. The chick's going, woo, woo, woo. And the, the majestic albatross completely ignores it. I mean, it's just so bizarre. And I can only imagine the kind of evolution that led to a reality where this albatross parent doesn't even see a chick that's not on its nest. I mean, there are all sorts of examples like that in nature where you really, it looks like there's something really intelligent going on. And you realize there's this little simple program and every step in the program has to be right or the whole thing falls apart. 
So it's it's so there are these tricks and heuristics that evolution has built into all of us. And those creatures, of course, have no idea that there's anything wrong because you can only see using the tricks and heuristics that have been built into you. So our species also get caught in these infinite loops and we have our own weird, stupid stuff that we do. We just can't see it, um, but we can see some of it in other creatures. If everything that we see is virtual, is, is, is kind of our virtual reality headset. Um, how the hell do we know what's going on underneath? Is there any way of figuring, like, if I'm if I'm a on a playing a computer game, if I was in a computer game, how the hell do I find out what's going on with the diodes and stuff? And the right, there's a good chance that we can't. Right. So the evolutionary argument that I just gave gives us no hope that that we're going to necessarily be able to see what objective reality is. And 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 again, I should point out that what I'm doing is I'm just taking our current best scientific theories, like evolution by natural selection, and just asking what they entail. I'm not saying, by the way, every good scientist would say, look, our best scientific theories are just our best scientific theories. We don't claim they're true. They're, they're just tools, but they're the best tools we have so far. And so my attitude as a scientist is, I'm, I'm taking the best tools we have so far, pushing them to their limits and seeing what they entail. So what, what natural evolution by natural selection entails is, the probability is zero that anything we see is the truth. That's what it entails. That's a stunning result of the math. Now, that invites me now to step outside our best scientific theories, right? Can I come up with a deeper theory of objective reality? And the, 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 the constraint is going to be whatever deeper theory I have of objective reality outside of space and time, I will need to have you know, a mathematical model of this deeper reality and show how it projects back into space and time. And when it projects, it better look like evolution by natural selection. It better look like quantum field theory and general relativity inside the headset, the space-time headset. If I can't get that to match up with what we see inside the headset, then my deeper theory is wrong. So, so there's no guarantee that we can succeed, but we can actually there is a guarantee that if we're wrong, we can see that we're wrong. So that's all we can do in science. <laughs> so, so, I mean, okay, lots of things to talk about here. Firstly, just backing up a wee bit here, this understanding, we have a, actually, we, this understanding that you've come to through evolution. I mean, it's a bit like Einstein. He, he, he uh, looked at Michelson Morley's experiment which said that the speed of light was seemed to be the same, whether we are looking, you know, whether the earth, the earth is going this way, you're looking at, you're trying to figure out how fast the light is coming from this way. And it's the, it's the same speed as it's coming from that way. And people are like, oh, that's a crazy experiment. That can't be right. Einstein said, you know what? I'm gonna say that's right. And then he worked through it all. Right. And he got this idea that of general relativity, you know, which is, crazy and it worked and it was better than newton's you've taken uh you have taken uh evolutionary game theory you've worked it through you've seen that it seems to suggest that what we're seeing and hearing and smelling is is not at all the real reality it's right. a virtual reality it has been created in order to make our our life a bit simpler. It's been created to simplify everything so that we can get food, which isn't or have mates, which aren't really food or mates, but they're, whatever the hell they are, whatever on earth they are, the, the, your taking natural selection, game theory, leaves you with that. You're even saying that space and time, the distance between my two fingers, doesn't have to be real at all. In fact, it probably isn't. You're saying that this distance could be a bit more like the matrix or a bit like we're a virtual reality game. And the metaphor is these fingers are just pixels on a screen, a virtual reality screen. And what's really going on is a lot of ones and zeros in some processor somewhere. Although, we, and the difficulty is finding what the hell that, whether that, what the hell I guess, the difficulty is finding what on earth is really going on to create this pixels. Exactly. That, that's right. And, and you're I saying, think, let's have a guess. Let's guess that's it. That's right. That's why we, we, let's have a guess. And, and the nice thing is about doing it at, in, in terms of science is that we, we have constraints on our guess. 
not to any guess is going to work. The guess has to show that when it projects back into our space-time headset, it has to give back the physics and the biology that we already know within our headset. So there are strong constraints. Now, it has to at least give, give us back those theories. It may give us generalizations of those theories, but, but those theories capture incredible insights, hard-won insights from lots of experiments. So this is going to be, so uh, there's a creative aspect. And of course, I can have a beer and think as freely as I want and try to ask, what is this outside reality like? But when it's all said and done, I've got to write down mathematics and show that I can get back evolution and quantum field theory and so forth. If I can't do that, then I'm wrong. So, so there's a creative aspect, but it's not completely unconstrained. It's constrained by what we've already figured out in our sciences. And so it's going to be fun. There's no guarantee that we'll get it right. But as a scientist, I want to make some proposals. And the proposal that I'm playing with is based on an unsolved problem in science, which is how are our conscious experiences, like the taste of chocolate, the smell of garlic, uh, the, the color of a rose, the red rose, how are those conscious experiences related to things in space and time, like our brains and brain activity? And the assumption that brain activity causes these conscious experiences assumes that brains exist and that space-time exists. And evolution by natural selection says that that's false. So it's, it's, we can't start with brain activity and try to get consciousness emerging from it. So what I'm playing with is the idea that conscious experiences not inside space and time, but just conscious experiences themselves and agents with conscious experiences outside of space and time. That's the fundamental reality. And my colleagues and I, Chaitan Prakash and, and, and others, Chris Fields and Manish Singh, have been working on a mathematical model that's completely rigorous. We can run simulations. And the idea is to show that this it's like a vast social network. So reality on this is a vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Think the Twitterverse, right? The Twitterverse, there's tens of millions of users, billions of tweets, lots of stuff trending, too much. You couldn't interact with all the Twitter users. You couldn't read all the tweets. You'd, you'd die. It was too, too much time. So what do you do if you want to see what's going on? We have visualization tools, right? If you want to see what's happening in England versus the United States, New York versus LA, um, or, an, or an individual Twitter user, you want to be able to zoom out, zoom in. So you need a visualization tool to a virtual reality visualization tool for all this vast social data. So that's what evolution gave us, right? We, so space and time is just a visualization tool that we have that's you, that we're using to interact with this vast social network. And we've just made a rookie mistake of, of taking our visualization tool for the reality, not realizing, no, that that was just a tool to visualize that vast social network. So in my visualization tool, I might see little red and green objects doing funny motions and so forth. And that, that's how I interpret what's happening in New York versus London in, in the Twitterverse. But Twitter users are not green. They're not red. They're, they're not moving in space and time. They're just they're, they're this vast social network. And so that's the, the, what I'm playing with. So what I have to show is that there's this reality of this vast social network, write it down in the mathematics, it's the Markovian dynamics that we're working on, but maybe we'll go category theory. And what we have to show is how we can boot space time um, and quantum field theory out of it. And the, you know, the, the one geek line on that is the long-term behavior of these networks of conscious agents leads to positive geometries which can then lead to space and time. The physicists understand how positive geometries can lead to space, time, and particles. What I'm trying to do with my team is to show that this network of conscious agents, when we look at its asymptotic behavior, we get the positive geometries that physicists have already discovered are behind space and time. So physicists are already looking behind space and time. They find these things called positive geometries, gross, positive Grossmannians, amplitudehedra, and so forth. What, what, what I'm doing is saying, I'm gonna start with a network of conscious agents way, way behind space time and show that the long-term behavior of these networks looks like these positive geometries that the physicists have discovered. They don't know what, why there are these positive geometries. And I'm saying the reason you're seeing positive geometries is because you're only looking at this vast network of conscious agents at over such a gross time scale, like a gross activity scale that you can't see the consciousness. It's like if, if you were in a helicopter above a freeway, and you look at all the cars on the freeway, it just looks like a bunch of little particles going down the roots of the freeway. And you can use you know, 
physics and you know, like equations of fluid dynamics to describe them, but you're missing that there's a person who's frustrated that turning the wheel and stepping on the brake, you're missing all the consciousness if you could look at a detailed level. And so that's why physics hasn't seen consciousness. They've been looking only at the gross asymptotic level. When we actually get a theory of consciousness, a network theory, then we can see that details and show how physics was just this headset. How many minutes have you got? Is it 30 seconds? Yeah, because I've got another interview coming right up and then they're on a the tight deadline. Okay, so um, do you think that physicists in general are not taking this idea seriously enough that the, the, of the virtual headset um, or have they grasped it fully? I think that some physicists really do understand that space time is doomed. So that, that, that phrase, space time is doomed, is not mine. It's Nima Arkani Hamed. He's a physicist at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Ed Witten, who's also there at, at the Institute, and David Gross. All three of these very, very brilliant physicists are saying that space time is doomed. So I'm, I'm, I borrowed that phrase from the physicists. It's not original with me. Um, but, but what I'm showing is that evolution by natural selection agrees with what they say physics is telling them. And so they're the guys that are looking very, especially Nima, or Connie Hamed, is looking very, very seriously about what's behind space time. He's found these positive geometries. I'm trying to plug into his work. If I can do that in a couple of years, I'll go bother him. R right now, I want to make sure that I have something that's worth his time to bother him about. But that's my goal. Thank you so much, sir. I super enjoyed that. And um, well good luck fun. with your next chat. And maybe in a couple of weeks, I, I might sure. request another interview with you. That was really Absolutely. good fun. Thank you so much and well done. A lot of fun, Rory. Thank you very right. much. Take care. Bye-bye.